Welcome to Charter Local Edition. Brad Pomerantz here. We are in the Inland Empire, joined by Connie Leva, a member of the California State Senate. Had a very successful year. At I know of three bills that got signed. There may have been more. Nine out of the ten we sent the governor were signed. Not it was bad. a very good year for Not Team Leva. Bad. Let's talk about one of the bills first, and that focuses upon what's known as environmental justice. Yes. You took a tour of your district, which is significant portions of San Bernardino County, a little bit of LA County. That is correct. What did you learn? What'd you see? So we uh, lovingly call it the toxic tour mm. I took with CCAEJ, and mm. they started in Pomona and took me out to San Bernardino, and the upshot of it was polluting facilities, polluting areas are all in poor communities. Mm. Um, my takeaway was if you're poor, you don't matter, and these cities, um, I think some of them were trying to do the right thing, just didn't know how to do the right thing. So that was really the impetus for me to author SB 1000. And when I think about another microcosm of that, right here in the Los Angeles, greater Los Angeles area, we had the Excite battery catastrophe yes. in poor Vernon. And then we had the Porter Ranch catastrophe in wealthier Chatsworth. Yes. Who got all the attention? The Porter, Porter Ranch. Ranch. Mm -hmm. Who got little attention? The poor people. In Exide. Mm -hmm. Flint, Michigan. Yes. Very similar story. Yes. So apparently you were on to something. Let's talk about SB 1000, which was signed. What had been the law back to 2003? So there really wasn't anything right. Right. Um, for yeah. environmental justice. This SB 1000 will now require cities when they do their general plan, when they update them, they have to include an environmental justice portion. We have a lot of uh, warehouses and logistics centers in the Inland Empire, yes. which is fine, but don't build it right in someone's backyard. Let's be smart about it. Maybe we build them over in this part of the city and we have our housing and development and parks over on this side of the city. And let's be super specific because I think it's important our viewers understand what's happened. Back in 2003, as you suggested, there had been a recommendation for cities yes. to look at environmental justice. Now there are seven mandated elements. I'm a nerd, I'm sorry. The eighth okay. element required now is environmental justice. Yes. Yes, which is a big deal. And it makes me excited that we're finally starting to take it seriously. The environment that we all live in, the neighborhoods that we all live in, even that we work in, should be nice neighborhoods. They should be free of pollutants. Right. We should know that our children aren't gonna have worse asthma because they go out to play. That we buy a home and it's not next to a polluting facility or a polluting facility comes in after we've already bought our home. How do we implement a plan in such a way such as SB 1000, where we consider those issues, but understand that California is competing with Texas, right. with North Carolina, with Wisconsin, that may have environmental regulations that are not as strong as ours. Right. How do you balance that? So I would uh, respectfully disagree Please. just a little you're bit. You're allowed, you're allowed. Um, California is the sixth largest economy in the world, so uh. I would say that we compete with other countries, not so much with ah, other states. Touche, go. <laughs> but I would also say that it's not that difficult. When you are a city manager, when you are a city planner, when you're on the city council, you take your city, you look at it, and you just, it's smart planning, smart mm. development. They may disagree with me that it's not that hard, but I don't think it'll be that difficult. I want to talk about a member of my family. Her name's Adela Santos. Okay. She is our nanny. In the pecking order of my family, I would say the cats are first, okay. <laughs> then my daughters, then Adela, and I'm somewhere down here. <laughs> but She's, I almost started, I could start crying. She's so, such a part of our family. Mm -hmm. My wife was sick for many years. Mm. Um, she became mother to uh, my two children. And uh, I honor you for protecting the 300,000 Adelas of Thank the state you. of California. Thank you. Tell us, I'm, honestly, I'm going to feel like oh, I'm start crying. It's, um, yeah. Well, I will start crying yeah. when I think of the amazing yeah. women, the amazing domestic workers, mm -hmm. the amazing Adelas who came mm -hmm. to see me and speak with me in December of last year mm -hmm. and asked me if I would carry a bill to eliminate the sunset mm -hmm. because they've Explain. had overtime pay yeah. for one year, uh, AB 340, right, I right. believe. Right, AB... Uh, 241. 241, thank right. you very much. Mm -hmm. um, but it was set to sunset in January of 2017. And how do you take something away from these, mostly women, 98% right. of those 300,000 What's are women. amazing to me is that prior to 2013, these domestic workers were working under a wage order, yes. number 15. Yes. 
that excluded domestic yes. workers that helped humans. When the NLRA was, very interesting. was originally yeah. written, you were entitled to overtime if you were taking care of the property, if you were taking mm. care of stuff, if you were cleaning the house, cooking. But if you were taking care of our most precious our items children. in the house, our yeah. children, right. our elderly folks, you were not covered for overtime. So just so our viewers understand, what's the new law now? The new law says going forward in perpetuity, these mainly women mm -hmm. will be entitled to overtime now as they that care simple. for It's that simple. Yeah, no, nothing nothing right, fancy. Yeah. Okay, let's talk about, oh my, SB 813. Yes. I think this may have been inspired by Bill Cosby, maybe, or the no. church? Or no. What was this Neither. inspired? But nothing? nothing? Okay, I'll be quiet. That's okay. This deals with the statute of limitations yes. surrounding rape. Don't tell yes. us what the law did. I will tell not. us what the law is now. The law is currently if you, if a woman, mainly women, but mm -hmm. men too, if you have been raped, if you go to a prosecutor in 10, 10 years and one day, and no matter what kind of evidence you have, you cannot pursue your case. There are some extenuating circumstances. If you're raped very young, you have a little bit more time. DNA. You DNA, you right. get one more year. Mm. But it's a little bit convoluted. This was brought to my attention. I did not know there was an actual statute of limitation on rape. And when it was brought to my attention, I thought, well, that seems ridiculous because there is no statute on murder and people are murdered oh, by accident. Oh, is that accident. true? That is true. I didn't know that. People are murdered by accident every day and there's no statute. No one is ever raped by accident. So mm. why should we have a statute of limitation Let's on rape? Let's talk more about the crime of rape. What really compelled me as I was reading about this specific piece of legislation is that, I mean, is this right? Only 2% of people who commit rape are convicted. That's correct. And what's even more remarkable is that very few will even report the crime. That's correct. Well, well, why is that? I would say, look at what's happening with the women that are coming out accusing Donald Trump. Right. Um, or Bill Cosby. Or Bill Cosby. Right. They are made to be the victims. Mm -hmm. They are told they're going to be sued. They're told that they are lying. There's a, there's a lot of shame if you are raped and you are made to believe that you did something wrong. And many times women will not come forward until they're a little older. Right. And that's, talk and that's us where through the, that. Yes. So be you're very young. Mm -hmm. You're raped. You don't get to a point in your life. Maybe you're in your 30s, your 40s, or even older or you have the confidence to come forward. And so many women know they're rapists. So many times they're members of their family. Right. That, that is a misnomer that it the is rapist is the guy that's lurking in, in, that is in the correct. bushes. That is correct. Usually you know Usually you know your the perpetrator. Person. So this, so these women would not have an opportunity to come forward under the current law if it's been more than 10 years. What's interesting to me about this law is that the burden of proof does not change. Right, that is correct. Now, on the one hand, as it should be, mm -hmm. But I could make an argument that maybe it should change. Maybe it should be easier, maybe it should be harder. I could go both ways on this. I think we leave it the way it is. Uh -huh. There should be a, a, a pretty high standard burden of proof because we don't want to incarcerate someone who is innocent. Right. So there does need to be proof, but we do want Especially to Especially with sure. time passing. Right. I mean, do but talk, are there safeguards or is it just safeguards we have in our- There's safeguards we already have. And as one woman said to me, I will never forget the face of the man who raped me at gunpoint. Mm -hmm. So I do think that there's a lot that goes on. There's a lot of times physical evidence, but you, if it's after 10 years, it can't be used. So this, this gives victims an opportunity to always hope for justice. Nine out of 10, how'd you do it? Nine, yes. Nine, how'd you do it, honest? Uh, you know what, I have an amazing staff and uh, on this bill in particular, amazing colleagues because everyone voted unanimously in both, both houses and we sent it to the governor and he signed it. Her name is Connie Leva. She <laughs> is a member of the California State Senate. My name is Brad Pomerantz coming to you from the Inland Empire, Charter Local Edition. <laughs> what were the, your other bills? Uh, so, yeah. let's see, we have... <laughs>